Hi you all, welcome to Anamet Library Talk. At today's talk, we have distinguished speakers with us, Andreas Robi, Ida Todt, and Ina Jacobs. Today's talk is entitled Studies in Byzantine Epigraphy First. The present uh, inaugural volume includes selected papers from the two panels dedicated to Byzantine Epigraphy held at the 23rd International Congress of Byzantine Studies in Belgrade, August 2016, and the 20th International Congress of Greek and Latin Epigraphy in Vienna, August, September 2017. The papers, as indeed the events for which they were initially produced, celebrate both the progress and the promise of epigraphy, epigra epigraphic research within medieval and early modern scholarship as whole. At this point, I would like to introduce our speakers. Andreas Ruby works at the Austrian Academy of Sciences Institute for Medieval Research. Within this institute, he is head of the Department of Byzantine Research. In addition, he is private docent at the University of Vienna since 2011. He has been serving as chair of the Commission Corpus Fontium Historia Byzantine of the Association International de Etude Byzantine. His main research interests are Byzantine literature, epigraphy, culture histor history, and the reception of Byzantine civilization after 1500 AD. He is the author of a four-volume corpus on Byzantine metrical inscriptions. Ida Todt is a university research lecturer and fellow at Oxford University. She convinced graduate convenes graduate courses in medieval Latin, Byzantine Greek, and Byzant Byzantine epigraphy. She is an Einstein Berlin Oxford Visiting Fellow, and she has published on Byzant Byzantine Reading Practices, Rhetoric, Wisdom, Wisdom Literature, and Epigraphic Culture. She is a co-editor of the series Studies in Byzant Byzantine Epigraphy and the chair of the International Commission for Byzantine Epigraphy. Ina Jacobs is a Stavros Niakos Foundation Association, Association Professor of Byzantine Archaeology and Visual Culture at the University of Oxford. Her research interests include Roman and Byzantine architecture and urbanism, the experience and perception of the built environment and its decoration, long histories of the display and reception of sites, statuary, and artifacts and material religion. She has worked on excavation in Belgium, Italy, the Republic of North Macedonia, and Turkey. She was a member of the Sagalasos team between 2003 and 2014. In 2016, she became the field director of the Aphrodisias excavations. Dear attendees, please be reminded Bear in mind that your video and audios are closed. Uh, please type your questions in the chat, chat section. Your questions uh, will be answered in the Q&A session. Now I'm passing the word to Ina Jacobs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irem, and also for putting this together and, and inviting me as well to get this chance to talk to both Andreas and Ida. It's, it's really a treat to be here and, and to just get an hour or longer than that to just discuss about Byzantine epigraphy with two great specialists in the field. So Andreas and Ida, I'm going to ask all um, I want to know about Byzantine epigraphy and I hopefully also what our, our listeners and viewers want to know about Byzantine epigraphy. Um, well, first of all, of course, congratulations on the volume, uh, which is the, the reason why we are here and this has been set up and we will talk about the volume in due course as well. Uh, but just to start off, also while well, having in mind that Byzantine epigraphy may be still a bit of a vague term for um, quite a few of us out there in the field. So could we maybe start with you giving us an idea and impression of how you define Byzantine epigraphy? I don't know who wants to start. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I mean, there is Byzantine epigraphy and there is classical epigraphy. And I think classical epigraphy is perhaps much more known than Byzantine epigraphy. Mm -hmm. uh, we can distinguish these two fields 
um, by chronology uh, and um, by content. I, by content, um, a Byzantine epigraphy differs from earlier epigraphy by the various media on which we can find inscriptions. While in antiquity, uh, most of the preserved inscriptions are on stone and mosaic, but mostly on stone, from the Byzantine period, we find many inscriptions which are uh, on, um, on wood, on portable objects in general, painting, a bit, especially um, Byzantine churches are full of painted inscriptions. We find them on objects of private or classical ownership, on silver plates, jewelry, ivories, and, and, and many, many other objects. And um, Cyril Mango, one of the great figures in Byzantine studies, and also uh, one of those scholars who were uh, very much interested in epigraphy and saw the, mm -hmm. impo the importance of epigraphy for Byzantine studies, he, 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 he described it in very clear words, I would say. Namely, I quote, on a broad definition, the discipline of epigraphy embraces all inscriptions other than those in manuscripts. And I think with this sentence, it's really well said what Byzantine epigraphy means by content. Thank you, Andreas. I'll, I'll take it from here. And then, Ina, you can just direct us in whatever uh, way you wish. But since Andreas has set um, the scene very nicely by defining this very broad and uh, um, all-inclusive field, um, I wanted to add uh, a, a little bit of information regarding the chronology. Um, as ever, this is an ungrateful topic. Uh, whatever framework we impose onto our material, something inevitably will be left out. Um, mm. Convenience is always a, a, a useful uh, guidance. And to begin with, we kind of started, and by we, I, I use a kind of the, the, the plural in, in involving anyone who has dealt with the field that we broadly define as Byzantine epigraphy. We use the convenient dates of the foundation of Constantinople on the one hand, and of course the fall of the city, uh, pretty much along the traditional lines uh, imposed onto the entity that we call the Byzantine Empire. However, the picture is much more dynamic. And what the scholarship in the past few decades likes to do, and I think that's for the better, this is something that really helps us think differently and more creatively about the material, is look at the chronology, not in terms of disruptions and disappearance, but in terms of periods of transition. And each of the periods that we can single out as being seminal, uh, the transition between the late Roman and late antique, then the period that we call um, the long late antiquity, which sometimes tends to go way below, beyond the sort of the, again, traditional boundary of the seventh century. Then the periods of the middle and the late Byzantium, they are all really there just to help us find the initial bearing, but bearing also in mind that they always invite influences from the outside, uh, also um, in some ways point directions in which influences went from within. Uh, we talk about uh, various habits and traditions and also something to, to which we will be coming back time and time again today because it's also one of the highlights of our volume. And that is um, a, a, a various, the use of various linguistic media. Uh, so um, uh, not mo monolingualism in terms of just looking at the Greek, late antique and medieval and early modern Greek uh, epigraphic production, but those traditions that are uh, tangential, neighboring, mutually influential, and involve the use of other languages. Sorry to be very vague, but we might actually continue this discussion. Well, later. yeah, I'll, I'll pick up on, on a couple of things that you said. So let me start by, by what you ended with, Ida, the, the multiple languages. Hmm. So it would be a misunderstanding to say Byzantine epigraphy, it's all about Greek. True. 
And what are other languages that a Byzantine epigrapher would need to be familiar with? I mean, ideally, and this actually really is not just about Byzantine epigraphy, but how we like to promote Byzantine studies in general, and particularly among the demographics of our younger colleagues and future colleagues, those who are still in training and consider academic careers, um, linguistic training is very, very important. When it comes to the field of Byzantine epigraphy, of course, Greek, very useful, Latin, not only for the initial centuries of what I discover, described as Byzantine, uh, when uh, during which well until to this, in, into the seventh century, actually Latin is one of the two official languages of the empire. Um, of course, the, the nascent, or in fact, the discovered epigraphies um, uh, in the neighboring areas uh, in, invite um, uh, basically, um, at least curiosity, if if not uh, a more more decisive engagement with this Syriac, Arabic, Middle Persian. Yes, again, these are not prerequisites, but we need to think more creatively. Latin, however, does come back into what we might again define as Byzantine epigraphy with the Crusaders and the 13th century, even the center of this empire no longer uh, temporarily being one, uh, uh, produces large amounts of Latin epigraphy, still extant, still available in collections in the museum, um, in, in, in Istanbul, um, Slavonic. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, also very, very important. So I would say to begin with, perhaps Greek and Latin, um, then, uh, uh, depending on uh, research interests, Syriac, Arabic, Slavonic, not to mention Coptic, I, I could go on. Yes, I, I, yes. this may be a bit too daunting uh, to, to say that you would need to learn all these languages to be a Always one group. step at a time. Yeah. Uh, 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 Andreas, would you... Yeah, if I may just add something. Yeah. Very often we find bilingual inscriptions in so-called yeah. contact zones where various cultures meet each other uh, at various uh, times. Uh, so it's not only restricted to late antiquity. For example, we find a lot of bilingual epigraphy also in 12th century Sicily and southern Italy when the Norman culture meets the Byzantine one. Not only bilingual, but sometimes even trilingual or quadrilingual inscriptions in which all the... Um, all the um, population which then lived on the island of Sicily, for example, are represented. So this mm -hmm. is multilingualism is a very big issue, and it's also reflected in epigraphy in these context zones, especially. Yeah? In the East, of course, and the transition from the Byzantine to the Islamic rule, but also uh, at a later period in southern Italy or on the Crimea, so in all these on, on the on the edges of the empire sometimes yeah, yeah. and uh, andreas you you started by by talking also about all the different media that are used in byzantine epigraphy so i think many of us will have a um, a tendency to think about epigraphy as big letters in stone as you say in the classical tradition mm -hmm. but um also as an archaeologist the way i encounter epigraphy is very often just as short words, um, what, what classical epigraphers would call graffiti or, or drawings or monograms. Um, is that an integral part uh, of your research field as well? Yes, of course. Of course it is. Um, we distinguish between uh, a formal and informal epigraphy. And informal epigraphy, this is drawings, graffiti, spontaneous writing, also belongs to the field of epigraphy. And of course, we also consider this material, which is huge and very completely, uh, not completely, but uh, a, lot of, a, lo a lot of work is still needed for it. Um, we are currently running a project in Vienna, which is looking at pilgrimage epigraphy, for example, yeah. um, mm -hmm. epigraphic traces, pilgrims left. So it's a very broad field. The problem is with these graffiti or dipinti uh, that um, some of them are known from publications, from old publications, but when we go in situ, they are not there anymore because mm -hmm. 
uh, it's not like a proper inscription with nicely carved letters or painted with big letters, which can stay for a much longer period, but it, it's scratched, it's scratched in the plaster, or it's just very spontaneous. And now it has vanished at some sites. It's not there anymore. So we have to rely on old publications in many cases. Yeah. And, and yeah. just really to, to tie on very, very briefly onto what Andreas has said, because this is again, something that is of the moment in, 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 the, uh, in epigraphic research. The, the, the sort of ever more emphasis on the type of material that is again conveniently called graffiti also invites questions regarding the ta taxonomy and also the questions of whether you know what we perceive as graffiti might not just be an informal and casual kind of public writing or maybe private but actually really can be classified mm -hmm. within what we kind of identify as formal uh, mm -hmm. genre of um of inscription yeah. That that indeed already clarifies something that uh, I was wondering when you said an, an inscription is spontaneous. Um, mm -hmm. What what does that mean? I'm assuming that there's a very broad spectrum from somebody yeah. who gets an idea to to scratch something very quickly to we have the utmost planning of a dedica dedicatory inscription of a monument. So most of what you're dealing with is somewhere in between, I assume. Yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing is, on the one hand, let's say many graffiti are, I would say, spontaneous writing. But on the other hand, these graffiti, in most of the cases, they follow an established pattern. Mm -hmm. So it's, for example, Kiri, if he got help, and then the name of the person who is, uh, is asking for help. On the one side, it's, it's let's say, spontaneous. Yeah, it's okay, it's perhaps a vague uh, term, but still... Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's a traditional pattern which is used. Yeah, yeah, it's based on something, and they've yeah. seen it probably before and are repeating. Probably so imitating, uh, and perhaps also other inscriptions are already there, and you add yours as a pilgrim, yeah. for example. Yeah. Which, which then I think brings us to the question: indeed, who is writing all of this? Because it seems like a very broad range of Byzantine populations could write, maybe, could read as well. Could you say something more about that, maybe? Who do you want to address? Yeah, either go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we both, uh, I guess, uh, can uh, say something uh, about this topic. And it is equally broad, and it uh, requires further, uh, basically, consideration. Um, Sometimes it is possible on the basis of the extant material to identify a skilled hand um, behind the ex execution of an inscription. And indeed, at any given time, we know that, that there were people trained to execute um, texts in uh, a, what we call a basically epigraphic uh, a style um, on different media. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 one branch, basically, of epigraphy is very much interested in that sort of agency, if you want, in the technology, but also in the technique, the production of inscriptions, uh, stonemasons, but also painters. Uh, uh, they are skilled and trained uh, craftspeople. On the other, and then again, we're talking about a very broad diapason, uh, uh, on the sort of the other extreme of this, this, this uh, basically axis, we have um, uh, people who might have some basic literacy and use it to basically express themselves, uh, be, di be that by just adding their signatures in important places, very often religious places, um, or actually uh, uh, standing in for um, crafts, artisans, uh, when there is lack of these people. I mean, we, we can actually have people who are, to say, semi-trained. And of course, the other side of this, this uh, um, equation is who is in the receiving end. And we mm -hmm. might actually uh, uh, discuss that too, but maybe we can leave that. Andreas, do you want to? Um, yes, I mean, this is um, a very important um, uh, topic. I mean, the literacy of the population and who mm -hmm. the question of 
who was able to write, who was able to read, who was able to understand um, a text which was attached to the wall, um, to a wall. But uh, the, the amount of people who were literate was, of course, very, very small, a very small, a, a, a very small layer of people was really capable of writing. Perhaps some, as Ida said, were capable of scratching their name somewhere or of mm -hmm. the standard formula, yeah. here we feel something like this. It's also, when you look at the, at the, and the handwriting and the orthography, you can perhaps learn that these people were not really literate, but somehow semi-literate. Yeah. Um, and on the other hand, of course, there's the big question of how texts were perceived yeah, as uh, as uh, Ida has already said, uh, how were they perceived? How who could read these texts? Uh, who was capable of understanding a text which was painted on a wall or carved in stone, and so on? And 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 perhaps this is already too far now. But I think one crucial issue is the following: text, inscribed text, is not only there to be read. Text has many many other functions. And if I could just so just you you can't leave us hanging there. It has many other functions. <laughs> Give and, us and a couple just, of examples. Two further issues, and then Andreas, you can kind of uh, take over and and continue uh, in as uh, basically on on in as prompting. But really, when it comes to uh, the the execution and the the the, the sort of uh, the the display of this this type of publicly uh, um, visible. Uh, or less visible material, uh, we of course need to consider uh, the, the reception. But the reception, as Andrea said, can be layered, and I'm, I'm sure he'll continue uh, on this topic, but we also need to consider that, in fact, certain types of publicly displayed texts uh, are composed in such a way that when they're once heard, they might be also memorized. We know uh, that poetry is the actually most suitable medium uh, in terms of it being not only didactic, but also mnemonic uh, uh, to be engaged on that level. It might be um, someone who could hear um, a verse being read out, uh, or there is a, a sort of cultural memory of that sort of uh, publicly displayed text being available, uh, uh, people might really repeat and receive it uh, orally too. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the other yeah. issue, uh, and that, that's because I said I had two points, um, the artisans, those who execute, we have again evidence uh, of um, basically skilled crafts, people working across media. So it's not a given that someone who is a calligrapher and who is actually really uh, 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 mostly employed to copy and work on soft surfaces, maybe copying manuscripts, would not be skilled enough to, in fact, paint an inscription in churches. And we have some evidence to that effect, too. Okay. Andres, it's over to you. No, I mean, uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with Ida. Um, the memorial culture in pre-modern societies, so in yeah. the Byzantine society, was really, really enormous. No? It was much, had much more significance than it has today. So people mem could memorize texts which were perhaps um, mm -hmm. uh, said uh, at certain occasions, who were um, uh, repeated at certain occasions. We, for example, know we don't have that much evidence. This is our problem, so we have to find really bits and bytes here and there. But perhaps, um, uh, for example, we have evidence for uh, the dedicatory inscription of the Pantocrator in Constant the Pantocrator Church in Constantinople, which was founded in the, in the 1130s by the Byzantine Emperor John II Komnenos and his wife. And um, and a text, um, a medical text, medical dedicatory inscription was com was composed and was also attached to the wall. And from the manuscripts, we learn that this text of the of this dedicatory inscription was read each year 
at the day of the inauguration of the church. And this yeah. is, we have evidence till the end of the century. So for many decades, yeah. we know that this text was read. So text was not that matter. So I said the many functions of the text, it was not that matter, but it was also performed. And especially as yeah. also Ida said, when it was um, metrical text, poetry, we've, uh, we've had a certain rhythm too so it was much easier also for yeah, people um, um, to to memorize this text or to remember this text and and i assume that that also for for texts that were sung like psalms that's that's the case right it, it immediately brought to mind absolutely the first words of a psalm on it so the the person wearing it and engaging with it could then in Ab their head, out loud continue singing the psalms for themselves absolutely absolutely and other functions of text, which I, because I ended with these many functions, uh, so it is, um, text is also there as part of a composition. Text is also a dormant. Mm -hmm. If text interacts with its surroundings, with a depiction, so it, it, it's, it, it's one composition and it makes, it, 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 it adores, it makes an adornment to, a, to, to, to a depiction, to um, a composition, whatever. This is the one, uh, one, one of these other functions. And another function which I would like to stress is text also has, uh, for example, when it's, uh, when we have many inscriptions on city walls, for example. Mm -hmm. So these are often, let's say, dedicatory inscriptions or building inscriptions. But on, this, on, the, on the other hand, they also have apotropaic. Yeah. An apotropaic yeah, yeah. function. And um, this is a very broad field, of course, apotropaic function of inscriptions, not only on monumental inscriptions on city walls, but there's a wide range up the till to amulets, for example, mm -hmm. um, who are inscribed and also um, bear this um, apotropaic power. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I'm, I'm sorry to take us back to classical epigraphy here, but when you said Text or Byzantine inscriptions also have a major function as a dormant. That, to my mind, doesn't remind me of classical epigraphy at all. Would you say that that is a difference, or am I just misremembering what I remember? Of classical um, I mean, I'm I'm not an expert in classical epigraphy. Perhaps Ida knows much more than I know. Uh, for Byzantium, I would say that um, script in itself um, becomes very ornamental. Mm -hmm. especially from the Middle Byzantine period onwards, when it's also equipped with accents, with breathings, with minuscule, minuscule letters. So it's perhaps also an influence from the Ara from Arabic script. This mm -hmm. Mango was claiming that there we see uh, similar developments at the same time. So it becomes more adornment, and very often script also reminds of script, which we find in manuscripts. There's a strong interaction. So... The script in itself is a picture, is an image, yeah, much more than it was in classical antiquity when the letters were rather, uh, yeah, rect in rectangular, uh, without that many variations. Yeah, yeah, and it also has to do with the nature of evidence that we have. Obviously, a writing culture changes over time. And the writing, such as we see it in extant epigraphic evidence, very much follows the trend that we see across the board. Uh, changes in writing habits and also fashions, styles, are very much reflected uh, in our uh, epigraphic material. Um, and uh, uh, what is also important to emphasize is that um, the, the uh, message, again, as, as Andreas has, has already uh, uh, mentioned, is not just in the inscribed text. It is, and that's why we like this not only word, but the approach, it is in the context. It is in the surrounding physical, basically, space to begin with, uh, but then it can be built up uh, to considering cultural uh, or social space as well. Uh, so it is just one element of what is uh, available. And uh, because we have other elements that contribute to the message expressed in the text, be they symbols, monograms, uh, artistic medium, uh, the site chosen 
um, they are also not only completing a message in a more complex and intricate way, but also addressing different audiences. Mm -hmm. Because not every uh, viewer slash uh, reading audience, member of reading audience can engage with the entire the entirety of the of the display uh, and and that sort of strategic communication is also part of what we need to to be considering um, i'm starting to get a very strong impression that byzantine epigraphy is indeed a, a major source for byzantine society as a whole and and everybody should at least be aware of that it is everywhere and will bring very different messages and adornments mm -hmm. uh to the place uh, where it is located I mean, uh, may, may I just say sorry, uh, sorry for interrupting. May I just say one 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 sentence? Um, for a very long time, um, it in scholarship, um, it was business epigraphy did not play a big role because it was stated that uh, epigraphy disappeared with late antiquity, and yes, this was the reason yeah. why because people all only looked at stone inscriptions. Yeah. And they didn't have in mind this big variety of uh, other media. Back to this question from the beginning, inscriptions yeah. are preserved. So there is, let's say, not 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 a continuation from antiquity, but something kind. There is a kind of continuation, of course, because there are still stone inscriptions produced and so on. But something really something new emerged, and this is also typical for Byzantine epigraphy. And and for this reason, and this. Is something which we have been trying for perhaps 10 20 years now uh, telling people that epigraphy is an important source for business and civilization it, it's true i also was taught uh, at university there's the decline of the third century and epigraphy disappears and then it's just uh dark ages all after yeah. that so it's, yeah. it's very good to hear a completely different story uh from the two of you but it, it does beg the question that um, we now have studies in Byzantine epigraphy volume one that's what you you produced but where do you sit in the wider development of, of Byzantine epigraphy as a discipline is this a very new thing does it start with Cyril Mango hmm. yeah we, we we are very uh, much aware that uh, what is being done now in this field is of course, very ex exciting and very creative and meaningful, but we that we do stand on the shoulders of basically the founding fathers of this discipline. And of course, Andreas uh, um, uh, will tell a little bit more about the development of the discipline um, uh, uh, historically or chronologically, but we need to actually note now that all the advances uh, are still very much uh, based and indebted to the work that has been done. I mean, we, we've already mentioned the names like um, Sierra Mango and Igor Shevchenko, but there are others and there are uh, some others who are still very active and very productive who have in fact um, set the foundation for us to continue and engage with this material and with any new that is being discovered as we speak in a, in a different and a, and, a, and a more diversified way. But the, the, actually, the, the basis of the discipline, and in fact, the basic work, which still continues, and that is, we have to really find these inscriptions, edit them, uh, make them available to actually be interpreted and studied. Uh, that is also part of our, our work as epigraphers whoever want to, wants to define themselves as such. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there is, there is a great deal of space for a, a various types of engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, Andres, I mean, would you like to say something about the um, Sorry, sorry. If, and... if, if you don't, I mean, um, I can say something about, let's say, the, the history of the of the discipline of business epigraphy. Mm -hmm. yeah, please do. Uh, a few words, and please allow me to share my screen. Ah. Uh, Can you see it? Yes, we can. Um, just very quickly, um, 
the epigraphic material from Byzantium was recorded very early, but mainly by travelers, ambassadors and so on, who came to the former Byzantine Empire, then the Ottoman Empire. Uh, in the 19th century, we have a first collection of, of what was then called not Byzantine epigraphy, but Greek Christian epigraphy, in order to distinguish it from classical uh, epigraphy. And this first collection, which is still of importance, was published within the Corpus Inscription Grecarum at, uh, at the Academy in Berlin. But this volume was not based on autopsy, so the scholars did not go to the, to the place and record the inscription, but took them from former collections. For example, from the from the, 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 the diaries of the mentioned um, travelers to the, to, to the Ottoman period, who recorded both uh, ancient and sometimes by accident, I would say also Byzantine inscriptions. Yeah, it was not their prime, their, very often their, their intention was to, to record uh, an, uh, ancient material, but um, yeah. Sometimes it just slipped through and we they also recorded something Byzantine. And at the end of the 19th century, um, many really important scholars, archaeologists, but also Karl Grumbacher, the founder of uh, business studies in Germany, they saw that we that there is a need both for a corpus of Byzantine inscriptions and uh, a handbook. Um, and this this wish, um, was repeated for a corpus um, and a handbook and, and other studies was repeated from the 19th century throughout the 20th century again and again. So some scholars were aware that there is a need. But the problem is we had some uh, publication ideas, ideas for series, but they they all did not, they all failed, they did not continue. So, but, but still, uh, there are still um, very um, important sources for us today. There is uh, a volume on the, on, on, on the Greek inscription of Mount Athos, volume one, then the, then it stopped. There is the um, um, edition of the inscription from Asia Minor by Gregoire, volume one, and then it stopped. But this was also due to some crisis in the 20th century, to the wars in the first half of the of the 20th century, but not only. And then there was this corpus, the Christlich, uh, the Griechisch Christliche Inschriften von Hellas, the Greek inscriptions from uh, from Greece. Um, volume one came out in the 40s, and then it stopped. Okay. There was the um, uh, there was the, the attempt to renew this series uh, much later in 1917. A volume of this series came out, which was dedicated to the Greek Christian inscriptions of Crete. So we see there, are, there were many attempts to create a corpus, but all of these attempts failed. Mm -hmm. This is also because there is a huge amount of, as I said, of Byzantine inscriptions, which cannot be covered by a single corpus. So I think today we have to give up this idea of creating a corpus. We, what, what is important now is to, as we have tried, to create an awareness of Byzantine epigraphy and with our journal, ha having created a platform in which Byzantine epigraphy can be discussed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so this is uh, a, a very, for, a very very short uh, story about uh, Byzantine epigraphy. It's just, I mean, that was the French. I would like just very briefly mention the French series by Paul Le Merle, also a great Byzantinist. He recognized that, of course, it is impossible to create a corpus of all Byzantine inscriptions. So he decided, let's create a corpus of Byzantine inscriptions, which are historic, although yeah. it's historical. Although this is, in my view, a very problematic term, because how can we define uh, historic inscriptions? I mean, what they did was mainly dated and datable inscriptions, but still we have also inscriptions of historic content which are not dated. Yeah, So a kind of problematic, but at least as you can see from this list, 
a couple of volumes came out. And these are really, this is the a very important material with which we are working right now. So, okay. I will unshare. Uh, so in the meantime, if, if that is where we are coming from, could you then, before we really dive into your series, tell us where we are now, what are the main scholarly approaches uh, that in the end also led you to, to start up the new series? Ida, we can't hear you, so I suspect you are you muted yourself. I think I'm now. There you are. Yeah, perfect. I I had a I had a a, a little bit of a um a cough and then I I muted myself. Okay, are you uh? Can you see now my PowerPoint? Yes, we can. Yeah. Excellent. So basically, really, very, very briefly, uh, uh, several points that have been made time and time again about the state of scholarship. No one uh, doubts that there is a huge amount of material, much of it unexplored. I would say that it counts in tens of thousands rather than thousands, as, as it was uh, uh, earlier thought. Really, we need to add that really voluminous body of material, which, which we've now defined as graffiti, I guess, but there are other types. Um, some of the floscules used to define uh, the field uh, and the material, um, some of the problems as well uh, that still persist. Um, um, a little bit of a problem, uh, uh, and uh, in fact, really challenge, I guess, maybe is a better word, and that's that there are no introductory studies. We don't have any handbooks mm -hmm. or textbooks from which to teach students. Um, a really acute issue has to do with the training, and uh, that results uh, in, in the neglect of the discipline, except Perhaps not. We like images, and I guess that these are really nice images that show um, the engagement with primary material and also um, the engagement of scholars with each other. Uh, one of the most efficient way of actually doing epigraphy, Byzantine epigraphy, is really to go where the source is. Inscriptions in C2, inscriptions in collections, they are accessible, they can be uh, uh, basically consulted, and the best way of engaging with them is in the company of other scholars. Um, a, 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 a really, uh, again, as Andres has said, in the past few decades, there have been more and more initiatives, um, various uh, uh, events uh, under the umbrellas of uh, congresses of epigraphy or Byzantine studies, specially designated programs that intend to gather people who are interested or experts in Byzantine epigraphy, and all sorts of recently major projects that have been uh, have received funding. Uh, publications too, this is really a very conservative selection, it's just, and again, of uh, uh, fairly recent publications. What mm -hmm. I want to say is that in fact, Byzantine epigraphy has grown into a very complex, very dynamic discipline, and uh, scholars approach epigraphic material from various angles. The number of questions that they ask, the number of issues with which they engage is getting ever uh, more numerous, ever more complex, ever more creative, ever more meaningful. And uh, this is where I would like to perhaps stop and then kind of move on, we might come back to some of these as we continue. Well, I, I think the, the obvious question is having this on the slide, how how does your series fit fit into this? How does it answer this? Maybe is, is it an attempt to bring some streamlining into all of this or? Yes, I mean, uh, Andres, would you, would you like to answer this question and then I, maybe we can Continue. Um, yeah, this is certainly the motivation behind the creation of the series. First of all, 
we wanted to have a series which is a platform for this, for discussing um, various topics of business and epigraphy mm -hmm. uh, and make it more much more visible. Uh, in before um, that, uh, there was no journal or series devoted to business and epigraphy, and some uh, of those who uh, published or commented on Byzantine inscriptions, they sent their contributions to journals which deal with ancient epigraphy. Mm -hmm. But um, this is great on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, these studies are not were not really visible to a broader audience of Byzantinists. But within the studies, it's now, and I think the studies is already known now, the first volume is known, and um, so it's much more, it's much more visible, business and epigraphy, and also studies, articles, contributions published in these studies are much more visible for, for, for a broader audience of Byzantinists. So this is, this is one was, was a motivation behind it. As I said, we are, um, and this is, I think, good beyond um, um, uh, yielding for the creation of a corpus. Yeah, there will yeah. there are regional corpora which are produced. There are thematic corpora. I, for example, I worked on the which was mentioned at the beginning. I worked on metrical inscriptions, which is now a complete corpus from the middle and so not the early, but the middle and the late Byzantine period. So we have this corpora here and there. And the more we have, of course, the, the bigger the picture gets. And this, uh, the studies are a platform to, uh, how to say, to expand our scholarship, yeah? to, to, get, to go into detail uh, with, uh, with questions which are uh, we think important uh, in Byzantine epigraphy in order to to get um, to move forward with the field and to create even more awareness of uh, Byzantine epigraphy among uh, scholars of Byzantine studies and neighboring fields. So that's perhaps Ida Ida can of course can, can certainly add something to that. It was just very convenient to actually have the next slide. Uh, um, uh, displayed uh, simply because it really reminds us of not only the whole idea that has been in gestation for a, a while, I would say at least for several decades, to have a specially designated publication platform as Andreas also defined it, but also to re realize it. Now, sometimes the two do not come together. We have been very, very fortunate that they have. Um, uh, so uh, basically, um, uh, going back to your question, Ine, um, the, one of the ideas behind this series is to reflect on the uh, basically development of Byzantine epigraphy and also mm -hmm. go back to the Desiderata. And as you can see, what we have envisaged this series to be, it's not just one uh, type of publication, but we envisage it as the quite dynamic and diverse, basically not only reflects the um, current uh, state of scholarship and desiderata uh, for the future, but also those um, um, aspects of this field that are very much lacking and that need to be actually brought to the present moment. So as you can see, on, on, on this slide, we need to also mention that uh, we have uh, founded a series under the aegis, if you want, uh, of um, and the support that definitely uh, uh, of the International Association for Examining Studies, uh, that our um, uh, uh, that our publishing house is Draples, and that uh, uh, we uh, Andres and myself act in our capacity, uh, joint capacity as uh, the series editors. Um, and that we envisage uh, basically a series not only to grow in uh, a number of volumes, but also in, in their diversity. Some of these collective volumes uh, will be dedicated to specific epigraphic themes. Uh, some of them might be monographs, basically based on a larger body of not only material, but also research. Um, and of course, we do want to invite and uh, encourage 
work with basic uh, uh, inscriptional material and um, uh, uh, the publication and the edition and 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 presentation of this material to a wider audience. So uh, as you can see, we 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 have been very ambitious with that, and now it's it's just about the tiny small thing issue of uh, persisting and delivering. <laughs> Well, you say that some of them of the future volumes may also be collective, some of them may be monographs. So how will they come into being? Are you actively seeking um, volume editors, contributors, or can people write to you and say, hey, um, I have something really exciting for you. Can it be in your series? Mm -hmm. Andreas, would you like to, to talk about that? Um... Yes, I mean, we have already a couple of volumes in the pipeline, um, namely um, people, scholars, colleagues who approached us uh, and said that they wanted, that they want to publish, uh, they ask for um, uh, if you're willing to publish their, let's say, conference proceedings um mainly conference proceedings within our studies so we have now already a couple of volumes in, in the pipeline there's also idea there, there also exist ideas of monographs um but they are not that advanced so far so it, let's say at a later time of the of the series which is now really starting we of course also would like have a call let's say call call of papers for a specific volume yeah but in the moment, this is not the case because we have already a couple of volumes in the pipeline. Yeah, but in the future, of course, this is our attempt. The series, uh, the volumes, will also be open for um, uh, for contributions which are sent to the editors, and so the the series functions like a journal. So it's going to be a mixture of series and journal. Yeah. As yeah. as are as are for example the studies in Byzantine uh, sigillography and 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 or the travaux et memoirs is some so so there are there are some other models which follow uh, this pattern. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that is all still in the future. Maybe we should also at least very briefly discuss what is in the current volume and how did that come into being. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. Okay, Ida, go ahead, please. I, I think your actually table of content is much nicer than mine, so I'll stop my share because mine is a little bit messy. So you could actually upload your uh, table of content. Me? Should I? Because it's actually much yeah, nicer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. Yeah, I let, will. Let me just stop sharing mine. Okay. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Yes, as was already said in the introduction by Irem, this is was the result of two conferences, namely um, a round table at the International Business and Congress in Belgrade 2016, and the third session at the Epigraphic um, Congress in Vienna in 2017. And um, um in the in in this volume um, of course we had to add some uh, introductory notes how we define byzantine epigraphy uh, on the one hand but also on the other hand what we would like to reach uh, with this uh, with this series with this publication platform and as you can see from the table of content there are, it's 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 not monothematic the volume. It uh, deals with um, various um, periods. It's uh, it deals with various languages, with various regions. So it is, um, I think, a very nice overview about um, uh, the concept of business epigraphy th throughout the centuries. Mm -hmm. And what was also important for us, and this I really thank Papers, the publisher, that Papers um, was allowing also papers written in languages which are yes. not English. Yeah. So yeah. we have uh, there's a German contribution, there are German contributions, 
and the yeah, is an Italian contribution. Yeah, so um, I think this is also of importance. Uh, we thought that a, a certain uh, multi. We are also always speaking about multilingualism and how important it was for a society. So I think it's also good to keep some multilingualism in this in this publication series. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah. Yes, I'm. I'm happy if you could just uh, stop sharing and then I'll. Yeah. Uh, okay. Because I'm, I'm very happy to talk a little bit more about uh, the themes in this volume, even though Andreas rightly pointed out that this was not specially commit uh, commissioned as. Um, um, let me just see. Bear with me. As one uh, 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 homogeneous volume. Uh, it is, in fact, something that very much holds uh, um, a, a theme, and it is, in that respect, I would say, coherent, too. So let me just go back to these themes. And uh, so you, you've seen uh, Andreas's table of content because it was much, much better uh, laid out. Uh, but I, what I would like to just give as a short overview um, are the range of themes and the coverage within this uh, volume, um, a broad range in terms of both geographic and chronological terms. And this is, as you probably heard uh, earlier, how, what, how we subscribe to the idea of Byzantine epigraphy. Uh, it is quite broad and it doesn't really, um, it doesn't suffer frameworks well. Um, in terms of other dominant themes, we have um, a, a breadth of epigraphic genre, um, a, a great deal of scholarship about, uh, and, uh, about uh, commissioners uh, and, and the role of commissioners as social actors. Also, uh, every single uh, uh, contribution pays significant attention to placement, visibility, leg leg legibility, and in mm -hmm. fact, one major theme are language choices. And this is where I would like to maybe uh, stop for a second and just, just flag those uh, important aspects that I think can be uh, gauged and uh, from the volume. Uh, basically, you can use it as a volume, I read it from cover to cover, and uh, you can, in fact, get a great deal of information and 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 some uh, really uh, creative, meaningful thinking on the idea of language choices and also uh, bilingualism or multilingualism in again very broadly defined by sometime epigraphy. Mm -hmm. And I've listed here in a slightly uh, um, uh, re uh, uh, repositioned way. Uh, themes, so rather than going through the table of content, which as you have probably no, no, noticed, follows, um, uh, does follow any theme actually we've ordered our contributions according to the alphabetical order of the surnames of the contributors. So you will not, from the table of content, the content actually gauge anything about the themes, but as Andreas has pointed out, actually our joint introduction very much addresses those benefits um, that uh, uh, anyone who reads um, either all the contributions are very strategically, only some of them would would have. Uh, so as you can see, language choices, uh, we, we have uh, a, a contribution about uh, Greek acculturation in Sardinia. Then we have a, a really significant, I would say, seminal piece by Sofia Colopisi Verti, and it's very detailed also about the use of Greek and Latin among foreign groups and individuals in medieval Greek. Um, and also um, something that we don't necessarily uh, can access either the, uh, due to the actually um, lack of evidence or inaccessibility of material. And that's how Greek exerted influence on local written cultures in the northern periphery of the Byzantine world. Mm -hmm. um, and then so there are several, uh, again, seminal contributions on the use of more than one language, sometimes next to each other uh, within one epigraphic display. So yes, this, this is basically something that I would uh, single out as a highlight 
one of the highlights, but this is actually really something that, again, really stands to um, uh, contribute significantly to the ongoing discussions and co considerations of these issues. Thank you very much for the overview, Ida, and for highlighting indeed what themes there are in the volume. Um, I'm aware that we've already reached a full hour, so this may be also a good moment to ask all attendees that if you have questions, please type them in the chat and I will present them uh, to our two speakers as well in your name. Um, whilst people are thinking of their questions, uh, I, I told you that I wanted to ask you a couple more personal questions at the end. Uh, talking about your own experiences and your opinions on Byzantine epigraphy, but but maybe to start off as a nice neutral personal question, could you just let us know, after having studied Byzantine inscriptions now for several decades, both of you, which one's your favorite? Ida, which one is your favorite? Well, I, I have to say thank you very much for giving me the first choice. Andreas, I'm not going to st steal yours. I mean, when we think about <laughs> Basically, uh, and, and needless to say, I have to digress. It's difficult to choose one. And I uh, have to issue a disclaimer. This is not my favorite. This is just really something, uh, an, an inscription to which I come back because it makes me think. But really, why not share that with our audience? Um, it just so happened that Andres and I had the same choice, not of the inscription, but at least the monument within which inscriptions featured. So for the sake of diversity, I've decided to go for something completely and utterly. Um, um, let me just see whether again I can share my screen. Um, um, I don't think that many people would uh, suspect that this might be my favorite inscription. And as I said, perhaps not a favorite, but, but the, the one that has caused me to stop and think more than once. Um, I haven't seen it. Uh, I have only uh, accessed it through uh, uh, publications, and I've also noted whose. Um, it's a stele. It's a funerary stele, uh, very loosely dated to the 6th century. It comes from Constantinople. Um, it's not a nice sight. As you can see, um, there is nothing appealing about the beauty of the letters. Um, the language, if you engage with it, is equally uh, um, subpar, as some people would say. Um, but um, actually what it says and the implications of the person speaking from within the text and describing uh, their particular situation and motivations for the commissioning of this inscription, which as we may guess, was not executed by a, someone, um, by a skilled uh, stonemason, but someone who was available to perhaps do a job, um, has been, to me, again, uh, a, a really um, a source of some consideration, simply because it just falls completely outside uh, any um, a sort of classic, not, not only classification, classification is fine, it's a funerary or commemorative inscription, but it really resembles in no way anything that we have uh, attested from this dominant uh, um, uh, the genre of, of inscriptions, funerary inscriptions, commemorative, or however we want to call them, um, actually by far the most dominant type they use formula uh, more than any other type of inscription. Yet this one is completely outside the norm. And as I say, also thought provoking on several levels. Thank you. I, the combination of both God and my mother's grief is, is quite something. <laughs> Thank you, Ida. Yeah. Um, Ida, would you mind Yes, uh, Andreas, I don't know if you also have uh, um, a slide prepared for yes, us. Yes, I, I have. Um, um, my favorite uh, description 
Um, yeah, Isa has already mentioned the, the monument. Uh, it's a monument uh, in Istanbul, which is um, of um, very importance for Byzantine cultural history in the Paleologian period, uh, so the period uh, in the 14th, 15th centuries. And this um, uh, church is the Pamakaristos Church, and the Pamakaristos Church has a chapel, which you can see here, a Pariklision in Greek. And this Paraclesian was built at the beginning of the 14th century as um, a burial place for a high official, Michael Tachyniotis. And Michael Tachyniotis was also um, buried in, in this uh, chapel. And you can find this inscription, which is very long. Uh, I don't know, can you see my, my cursor? Um, it's not moving, but... Yeah. Right now? I'm still not moving. Okay. Uh, so when you look at the cornice, it's it's on the cornice. And it's uh, today not um, fully... Can you see it now? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. So sure. here's the cornice. The cornice of the Paraclesion, which is not fully preserved anymore, which means that also the inscription is not fully preserved anymore. It's a metrical inscriptions, a verse inscriptions. Um, and this is one of the few cases where we do not only have the inscriptional evidence, but also the manuscript tradition. And therefore, we can uh, reconstruct the entire text. Mm -hmm. It was composed um, by one of the most prolific authors uh, of the Byzantine Empire by an author on commission uh, called Manuel Feliz, who um, wrote thousands of verses for on commission for various members of the aristocracy, the imperial household, and the high clergy. So he was also commissioned to write a poem, which is a, a funeral poem for the deceased Tachyniotis. And it's mm -hmm. it's written in the name of his wife, who was then had become a nun. Uh, so he was he the words he's using seem as if they come from from uh, from Tachyniotis' widow. And when you look, um, and, and it, it's a very poetic, it's high rhetorical, high poetic. So this Felice was the, one of the best poets ever. And ever. On, on, only, um, let's say, wealthy people could uh, afford such a, such a poet. And when you look at the, uh, so it's not only the content, which is really high quality, and the verse is of good quality, but also when you look at the, when you look at the, uh, at the letters, they're really nicely carved. So mm -hmm. uh, here, as you can see, script is adornment. The cornice yeah. is adorned with these letters. They, um, they, are, they are in combination, they are combined in ligatures, there are abbreviations, there are, uh, there is in, uh, punctuation, everything. Yeah. So the one or the workshop who was working with on for the great the the stonemason must have been really gifted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is no orthographical error. Yeah. Let's say under quotation marks. So it's it's really very high quality from various angles. And since it's metrical, it's one of the metrical inscriptions. I would say it's it's my favorite. Can I just ask Andres, would yeah. this have been colored as well originally? Um, yeah, this is I, I don't know. I mean there are no there are no traces of colors, but of course um we very very rarely there are traces of colors. We we know that um letters which are not carved from the stone but really were carved into the stone, mm -hmm. we still see some holes, recesses. Uh, mm -hmm. Where we know, for example, on the city walls, but also on other at other places, where we know that uh, some shining material was attached. Yeah. So, not necessarily gold, but uh, any other kind of shining material, so that um, the inscription, the letters, were um, better visible from afar. Mm -hmm. If I may just. Uh, 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 again, not just because I said that this would, would have been my, my choice, although uh, actually the inscription that I would have chosen is in the one in the apse, and it's uh, executed in a different technique, um, and it's very shiny and bright, 
so your question about the, the, the sort of the effect of the color, and in that case, also the medium can be really answered much, much more um, uh, uh, with much more detail. But in fact, your question back, back, back to your question as to whether this was painted, obviously this would have been exposed to the elements. So any trace of original uh, paint would have gone uh, um, and disappeared a long time ago. If we go into the interior, uh, there are several uh, inscriptions, one of which again is metrical, but it's uh, painted rather than um, carved. Um, and the painting, uh, is not only in terms of style, but also um, uh, the, the, the display also sort of on, on the level, which would have been um, similar to the one here uh, on the corners, uh, in fact, uses uh, very effectively the color to um, the effect that, in fact, that, 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 that the visibility is increased, that the background is darker, then the, the letters are lighter, and that it's actually much easier to engage with, with the text. Yeah. Uh, so that, that might give us some pointers about the display of some of the yeah. It is interesting that both of you even went for the same building in Istanbul as as a favorite uh -huh. inscription, though. Yeah, and then and in fact, this this particular Periklesion, uh is an example of how creative epigraphic uh, display can be. We've lost Tina for it. Oh, th there you go, go. Uh, because we have not only multiple uh, inscriptions displayed on the outside and inside. But in fact, in different techniques. I mean, if you look at the architecture and the, the of the, of the church and see how dynamic it is, likewise the epigraphy. We have some inscriptions that are carved in stone, some executed in mosaic, some painted, and in fact, we have one uh, in brick in brickwork just above uh, yeah. on the high register there, and, and yeah. there's it's showing it. So this is also an example of a sort of broader cultural, if you want. Uh, poetics, where this sort of um, dynamic uh, and also versatile uh, display can all all kind of fit within one uh, a particular monument, and then they, they actually do go together. I'm sure the Byzantines perceived them as harmonious. We might yeah. have them in a slightly different way, but this was a, a sort of a cultural desideratum, actually, to show a range. Um, it, mm -hmm. it, uh, something that's very much appreciated. Okay. Um, in the meantime, we also have a question in the chat. Um, one of our attendees is asking what tools or qualities should a new epigraphist be trained in in order to meet the current needs of epigraphy? And the question is actually foremost about digital tools, um, but maybe can also be brought into what makes a good Byzantine epigrapher? I think Ida should start because she's teaching epigraphy. <laughs> oh, I don't know what my students would say about that. <laughs> but in fact, um, uh, digital comes definitely into the picture. And, and this is something that uh, we're only uh, learning uh, uh, now. Uh, but the training, the training, and, and I'll, I'll talk about the training, and then maybe Andreas can say something about basically those additional skills that are needed in order to engage with this material firsthand. Uh, so uh, again, I, I go back to the point that I made earlier. Languages are important, uh, but we don't ever at the, any graduate level even expect uh, complete fluency or perfection. Um, epigraphy is in fact a very useful discipline to help um, students progress also in their linguistic training. Um, some inscriptions are formulaic. Uh, I might also say uh, simple, and that's always a good, good starting point. Um, uh, basically for students to engage with and uh, gain some confidence and then progress through some more uh, difficult uh, um, uh, examples of epigraphic uh, production. Um, I would say the training starts 
as soon as possible at graduate level, ideally uh, graduate courses, uh, uh, whether they're in medieval studies or late antique or uh, late antique Byzantine would include uh, a course in Byzantine epigraphy. And the most effect effective way of teaching it is to try to produce something that is a survey course and then combined with workshop sessions first within a classroom but then definitely definitely and i really subscribe to this uh and i believe that that's the only way forward going to the source and that source doesn't have to be material in c2 in fact much of what we have is no longer in c2 but really that first hand immediate engagement with what has survived it just opens so many uh, basically additional insights that we cannot get just by sitting in a classroom talking about um, the scholarship and even really reading inscriptions from editions uh, and and uh, uh, off the maybe even page. Um, so yes, all this very very important. What is perhaps most important, and then I'll pass it on to Andres, is. Um, to basically shake off any expectation that that sort of knowledge is available. It won't. In most cases, this is about looking for opportunities, um, stealing knowledge as well, if you want. Um, unfortunately, there are no, as, as we pointed out, textbooks, handbooks uh, that would and could be meaningfully used. So the students at whatever level they're motivated will have to look for their own, for, for, for uh, uh, whatever opportunities they can find. And I can guarantee you that there are people on the other side uh, being very happy to uh, help them. And, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely agree with what Ida has said. Um, I can only add a few um, things. Uh, the question was, uh, what tools should the new epigraphist be trained? Um, I think, uh, yes, of course, it's very important to go to the inscriptions, to see them in situ or in the museum, because in, from my own experience, I can say it always gave me a completely different uh, experience when I saw them. Because when you see them in the book, when you see an image, you cannot imagine what it really looks like. And so you have to see it uh, either in situ or in the museum. So this is important. Try to see as much as possible to get the feeling for what an inscription is. On the other hand, if some additional training, I would say it's always good to have a kind of knowledge of paleography, of Greek paleography. It's also good to be trained, to have a certain training in philology, because um, not all the texts are easily um, readable or some have lacuna. So some training in lacuna, so some training in philology may help you to restore a text, to better understand it, to translate it. What is also needed, I think, because an epigraphist, he cannot be, he cannot be an art historian, archaeologist, a philologist, a paleographer, everything together. This is not just not possible. I mean, you can, of course, you, me, for example, I'm coming from philology, and then I, within the years, also tried to get some of course, limited knowledge about art history, archaeology, and so on. So I think collaboration is needed. Very much collaboration so that archaeologists, art historians, and the epigraphists, philologists work together in, 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 in really to understand what, what, you know, what the inscription is. Because everybody has a, 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 a different view, uh, may um, uh, recognize something else uh, within an in inscribed text. There are some digital tools. These digital tools are, uh, so let's say, digital corpora of uh, of uh, inscriptions of antiquity and um, and of uh, of the Byzantine period. There is the the so-called PHI, the fee, uh, 
database, um, which also encompasses a lot of Byzantine, late antique and Byzantine material. There is in Berlin, if I'm not mistaken, this database of Christian inscriptions, Greek Christian inscriptions. Um, there is um, a project which was created by Charlotte Rocher. She's also one of these persons um, um, uh, whom we uh, owe a lot, I think, in the field because she has always been very interested in bringing the field forward. And she has always um, been uh, emphasizing the importance of digital humanities yeah. or epigraphy. So there is this project was started for the uh, Greek inscriptions on the north shore of the Black Sea, I-O-S-P-E. You will find it very easily when you... Uh, type it in your search machine. So if it's here and there, there are some resources, digital resources, which offer inscriptions. Uh, the last project I mentioned, the, the, the inscriptions there are also translated, they're commented. You can switch between a, a diplomatic uh, transcription and um, a transliteration in minuscule letters. So um, it, it's also good to learn to use this uh, database. Uh, to learn how inscriptions are transcribed, how how they are commented on, and so on. No, absolutely. Um, and can I can I just pick up on that for a second? Because now we're we're always talking about inscriptions that are already there, available in one form or another, be it still on the object or in situ. Um, but what about techniques like well, what would you use for registration of the graffiti that you're working with in the pilgrimage? project, for instance, Andreas, is that something that you register using normal photography, RTI photography? Do you use anything else? Yes, we are using um, uh, normal photography, I would say. Well, we uh, were about to use um, technique which was creative 3D uh, uh, camera um, uh, images by um, which were de developed by our cooperation partners um, in Russia. Uh, but due to the war, we were uh, unfortunately not able to go uh, to many sites. Um, my, yeah. Only my colleague uh, went with the team to Jerusalem and yeah. uh, recorded uh, uh, some of the graffiti with this technique. Yeah. So that, that this is a developing field, in other words, we it, are it is, yeah, on it is, yeah. Registration. I mean, it's uh, we have we are having a four years project, so this is this is just beginning, yeah. Of a, but there is um, there, there is some interest in epigraphy, as uh, can be seen by a volume which also Ida showed, which was published a couple of years ago, by Fell and Ward Perkins, which really yeah. is essential, I would say for any further studies on epigraphy, uh, on, on graffiti, on graffiti depicted. Yeah, yeah. And then just, just an additional bit of advice for people looking for opportunities and then training uh, uh, opportunities in particular. Keep uh, your eyes and ears open for any announcement of training programs. And they do happen. There is a series of workshops uh, organized uh, by um, a, a project that was uh, uh, that received major funding. I think it's based in Bonn. Uh, but Andres, you can actually correct me if I'm wrong about inscriptions in the di digital environment and also um, uh, regular training sessions that teach people how to use EpiDoc. It's again something that Charles Rocher and her team uh, developed. These training opportunities are uh, available and they are actually circulated and announced. Uh, yeah, well. absolutely. Now it's it's Cologne. It's Cologne. Oh, Cologne sorry, sorry. Yeah, the the team of Claudia no, Solia yes. and Ma Ma Martina Filosa, and yes. they are um, they are doing digital humanities, mm -hmm. primarily on seals, but also I mean inscription on seals are also epigraphy. Um, but they uh, you can also apply these techniques for any other for any other for formats of epigraphy. Yeah? Um, and then maybe let's move on to, to the next question that was in the chat uh, by Meric. Um, she would like to hear your comments on how you see 
your work functioning at or covering the intersection of disciplinary boundaries between literary star studies and history, art history, archaeology? Where does a bigger fee sit within all of this? I think we've touched upon that already a number of times, but it's probably a nice topic to end with as well, I says think, the archaeologist. <laughs> I think if I may start, I think it's such just sitting in the in the middle. It's the, sitting right in the middle, in the middle. of it. <laughs> I, I was speaking about the competences one would need to approach an inscription properly. Uh, of course, not um, not Mango was he was a polyhistor Mango and Sevchenko, so they had so many. They were trained as archaeologists, but also they had a deep knowledge of philology, epigraphy, and so on. Um, so, of course, try to learn as much as possible from each of these fields, but look for collaboration and talk with archaeologists. Art historians should talk with epigraphists and philologists and the other way around. And that indeed is one of our missions, not only with this series, but because we are talking about the series, then we have to emphasize. Basically one of our major, major uh, desiderata is to open uh, not only the field, but also this publication platform to scholars in related disciplines. And as Andreas has mentioned, history, art history, literature, um, and also, equally importantly, really to reach out to the academics in uh, neighboring fields, so to say, classics, medieval, early modern studies, Renaissance. Uh, inscriptions are prominent in these uh, fields too, and some of them have actually either advanced uh, further or in directions that might serve as inspiration to us. So yes, no easy definition, and that's perhaps the the the, the good 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 thing about Byzantine. Oh, we have no further questions in the chat, and we are almost reaching ninety minutes. I think, as as an archaeologist who was giving the opportunity to talk to two epigraphists uh, for an hour and a half, thank you very much uh, for this, and I will give the word back to Irem for the closing of the session. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, dear listeners, uh, thank you for your questions also. Anamet Library Talks will continue in July. You can follow the details in our website and social media accounts. Uh, thank you again and good evening to all. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks. Good evening. Good evening.